Hello, Gary. Hi, Guy. Uh, nice to see you after such a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Since we were on the train together back from... Oh, God, I can't remember now. Where do we play? Plymouth. Plymouth. <laughs> and we're off um, again tonight. Yes, and we are off again tonight, but today we're speaking to someone who needs no introduction, although we will give him one because this is literally an introduction. <laughs> Mr. Kenny Jones. Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot to get through, actually, because he's had... He's been part of three major groups. Small yeah. Faces, Steve Marriott and, and that whole mod scene, and then The Faces, because or oh, 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 should we say Faces? Is yeah, that's the thing, Faces. And there's actually a copy of that first album with Small Faces on it, isn't there? Which In I America, yeah, they yeah. didn't want to release it as Faces, did they? I can, I've always called them The Faces, but... Yeah, they, they are The Faces, they're The Faces. I mean, look, I've got a copy of uh, A Nod's As Good As A Winx that, right there. Uh. And it says Faces. And that's what they were. Um, and then The Who. Yeah. And I, I actually sat on a helicopter with Kenny to go to Live Aid. Oh, well, there you go. He would there have forgotten you... that probably by now. Yeah. And the well... amount of helicopters he gets on. <laughs> and then loads of stuff. To, I mean, he was always, he's clearly very popular, very liked as a drummer. He, you know, he's played on loads of things for loads of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but, you know, it's going to be some interesting stuff, you know, because he was also playing with Rod during that whole period where Rod had faces and his solo stuff going at the yeah. same time, which led to all kinds of sort of fractures within the band. Um, but we'll ask him. He's just got off his horse, I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's Kenny Jones. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's, uh, it's fabulous. So great to talk to two guys that have done this. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. Too, too get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. How are you doing? Hey, Kenny. We weren't, we weren't good, sure. Good, Kenny. We were getting nervous. Oh, yeah, I know. So was I. I couldn't get work the bloody computer. <laughs> oh. And everyone's out, so there you go. Can we, can we get to see your face, do you reckon, if you... If you got... Yeah, I'm going to try and figure out how to do that now. Oh, there you go. Yay! Hey! We're on. We're away, we're away. Look at that. Who wants to keep my wrong face anyway? That had, <laughs> had some small face. <laughs> oh, you know, there you go. Can't get away from that small face. <laughs> Where are you? Who'd want to? I'm in, I'm in my little office in the house, trying to wake up, really. Yeah, thanks for doing, seeing us so early. We're, on the middle, we're in the middle of a tour, Guy and I. Are you in it? Oh, great. Yeah, with someone you know, okay. actually. Who's that? Nick Mason. Oh, great. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, we're just about to go <laughs> off to I've, Europe. I've seen, I've seen a couple of gigs you've done. It's really good. Really, really good. Oh, oh thank you. Really enjoyed it. That's... Oh, Nick says to send his very, very best. He said, you're always, a, you, you're always whenever there's any charity thing or anything that needs doing, you're always one of the first to kind of pop up. Uh, you're very good like that. Yeah, it's great. It's nice to do something nice, you know. And, yeah. you know, Nick, I mean, I think it's public knowledge, Nick's 78, and he's out on the road. He's just about to do nine weeks in Europe, and he's playing like a demon. Yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, that's all you need is a little bit of practice. When you have to stop playing, I don't like stopping playing. I hate days off because basically all your muscles go and you, you, you kind of just get, you get out of shape really quickly. Yeah. Are you playing all the time? Do you play a lot, Kenny, still? Do you? I, Every day, if, I, if you're not I, working. I get lazy as I get older, you see what I mean? So I, I kind of, you know, when they say we're a keyboard player, you know, it just says, all I have to do is run my fingers across the keys, and that's good enough for me. <laughs> I, kind of, I sit behind a drum kit and I go, oh, this looks good. <laughs> <Just play through. laughs> this looks like, like I'm just of toms, and there you go. That's hard work. <laughs> I, I, I was speaking to Matt Clifford recently, and, 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 I, and I saw something in on the internet, but it, you, you, you've been... But it's possibility of some new recordings from the from faces. Yeah, right? yeah, we're, we're really excited. We've already been, we've, we've recorded some. Ronnie Wood and I have, have recorded about twelve songs. Uh, and Rod sang on six of them so far. That's fantastic! Oh, amazing. Who's pl who's playing bass? Uh, well, Ronnie at the moment, because what we do is we Ronnie and I just put down the guitar and drums like we used to, and then Ronnie comes in, puts a bass on, and we just build it like that. 
And has Matt been working on the key? If you're stuck, you know, I'm just... <laughs> oh, I'm always, we're always stuck, you know. <laughs> has, has Matt Clifford been playing keys? Yes, he has. He plays great words as well. Really great words. Oh, mate, amazing. I mean, listen, can you just clear something Brilliant. up for me, Kenny? Because we were talking about this earlier. Is it faces or the faces? What do you say? Well, you it can take it either way, can't you? It's basically, it's faces. He used to drive Mac. No! He used to drive Mac nuts. Because he always says, it's faces, it's faces. And I said, well, it's the faces and the faces. Oh. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about your early days. Let's talk about that, that man yeah. that you just mentioned. Well, actually, funny enough, he wasn't in the band, was he, when you first started? It, it no, was Jimmy w Winston. Jimmy yeah. Winston, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Langworth is his real name. And he changed to Jimmy Winston. And uh, it's only because his, his dad had a, a mum and dad had a pub that we used to rehearse him. So we could use that. So we, got, we had to get him in the band. <laughs> Oh, so it's one of those because there's always, I always wonder there's in every band there's a guy who's sort of sitting in his castle or whatever and he knows it's because he had a van. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like, it's like our, our, our percussion player at the moment, right? Nick, he's great. He's, he's fantastic. He's good. He's good. He's, good. he's got a helicopter. So, we... <laughs> <laughs> so he's definitely in the band. Same sort of thing. Yes, yeah, <laughs> but, but Kenny, you you grew up in the East End. Was it Whitechapel? No, St Stepney. Oh, Stepney. Between Commercial Road and Cable Street. Oh, what was what was the what your dad do? What was the mu was there music in your family? No, no. My dad was a lorry driver, typical sort of delivering. Uh, I grew up on Argentinian beef, which he used to nick and bananas. <laughs> 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 oh, that famous old East End diet of Argentinian oh, beef and bananas. Exactly, and my, my his, his brother, <laughs> Uncle Jim, used to work up delivering tea and tea chests, gravy tea chests. So we used to get loads of tea, you know, loads of it, stuff, anything that got off the back of a lorry. And this is when everyone else has got rationing and you just got a house full of beef and bananas. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I was a kid, I didn't know any better, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one thing, Kenny, of the, it's a tiny little point. But Kenny with two E's. Yeah, because basically... What's that about? Basically, what it was... Everyone keeps asking me the same question, and I, cause they keep pronouncing, why do you call yourself Kenny? And I go, I'm not Kenny. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just Kenny. <laughs> but the thing is, when I, when I joined in the 60s, when I joined the, the PRS, there was about three or four, maybe five Kenny Joneses, or Kenny, uh. Kenny Joneses. And I said, well, look, stick an E in my, an extra E in my, and you can separate me from the other Kennys. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> And what about what about drumming though? How did that add into your life, Kenny? Oh, can I? I originally, I originally wanted to play the can I? Can I? <laughs> can I? <laughs> no, I'm going to lose it now. No. Uh, I originally wanted to play the banjo because I, I, every I used to clean cars with a mate of mine, uh, you know, every, every Saturday morning, and uh, and he threw the sponge, it hit me in the face, and it got my attention. He said, "I think we should form a skiffle group." So I didn't want to feel s s sort of stupid, so I, so I said. What's a skiffle group? And he said, well, it's, you get your mum's, uh, hang on, no, tea chest. No, you get a tea chest. Tea put chest. Put in the Wash, end. Washboard. Oh, yeah, and, and a washboard. Uh, yeah, and a washboard. And fimbles, you get your grand's fimbles on your ends of your fingers and you rub, rub up against it, the, the washboard. By this time, uh, once you explain the tea chest and all that shit, and the ba it makes a bass sound, I thought it was nuts. <laughs> he said, there's a skiffle group coming on the TV tonight. We only just got a TV, right? And it was... Um, we went back to watch it, and it was um, Lonnie Donegan came on. Right. Singing right. Rock, rock Island Line. Rock Island Line? So, yeah, you got it in one. Singing Rock on the Line. I fell in love with the song. I fell in love with the banjo. I fell in love with the sound. I just loved it. I just thought it was great. And I remember seeing a banjo for sale next to Bethnal Green Station in a pawn shop. And just we went there, and the banjo had gone. Oh. So I said, said to the guy, where's the banjo? He said, it's gone. The guy's played his money. He's taken his banjo. So we get it back. And he said, I can't, I can't get it back. I said, well, look, you know, what am I going to do? And so my mate said, I've got a friend who's got a drum kit. I'll get him to bring it around this afternoon. So he brought it around that, that afternoon. And it turned out to be not a drum kit. It turned out to be a floor tom tom, a bass drum, and two sticks. And one stick was broken in half. So we, <laughs> so we tried to glue it, which is impossible. Spent a couple of hours doing that. So I learned to play on one, one and a half, six. <laughs> you must have thought many times, what would have happened if that banjo had still been there? 
Yes, I could have been. Where would you be now? Uh, Playing with Jeff Beck and <laughs> Jimmy Page. He would have been. Oh, I'd have been the best banjo player in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love George Formby so was like, when I was a kid all the black and white films George Formby was when I'm cleaning windows when I'm cleaning windows but, uh, yeah. I eventually bought myself a banjo years later when I joined who I thought I've got to buy myself a banjo I was just get it out of my system I, I ended up buying the wrong banjo I bought a, instead of the George Formby one a little short one I bought a, like, a long neck one which is five string oh is that with the string that ends halfway up that's it got it yeah yeah, it, it looks fantastic. It's mother of. Uh, yeah. just, it's, I just hang on the wall just to remind me. It's more American, but um, but what, what, when when did you meet the others? I mean, when when did people like Steve come into your life and Jimmy Winston and Ronnie? In the East End, there was only one uh, music shop, which is where I bought my first drum kit, a little white Olympic set. What, at bar sixty or something. J, the J sixties in Man Jay Manor 60. Park, Green Lane. Yeah, and Ronnie Lane used to live at the top of that road. And, and Ronnie, when I first met Ronnie. I'm cutting a long story short here. When I first met Ronnie... Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to. Right. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. I, learned, I was teaching myself how to play drums. After about three months, I, I heard about this uh, jazz band that was playing in a pub called the British Prince in the East End in Stepney. So I went up there and I sat in front of this guy, the drummer. And it's like pretending I was old enough to drink. And I looked all, all, every bit of 12. But I had a suit on, see, so it made me look older. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, this I got. Is it three button hand me down? Yeah, uh, no, we, yeah, probably, yeah, it's, uh, probably, you know, big shoulders. Uh, so I said, to, so I, I just sitting there watching the drummer, and uh, his name was Roy, and um, he, he'd play and he'd sing as well. He had a res, you know, a reslo mic that came up between his legs and sang like that. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. I've never seen a singing drummer playing the drums around the microphone like that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I, I looked and I just I just watched him a couple of times just to see what picking his, picking something up you know little feels and stuff and the guy uh, he, he he came over to me after after I, when I had a break and he said to me you taking a piss I said what are you talking about he said he said well you keep blinking at me I said oh I said that's because you when you play you go oh yeah he blinked his eyes <laughs> go like that. Buh, 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 and he said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. no, I don't. <laughs> no, I've got to know him really quickly. Let's put it that way. And I explained what, explained what I was doing. I said, yeah, I'm just trying to pick up a few tips. Blinking like tips. <laughs> exactly. So, so that was that. And then... Um, few, I'm picking up a few blinking tips. <laughs> I know. <laughs> blinking tip, yeah. Exactly. Very good, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Then I uh, watch, I sort of watched him every other week, and then one day he said, he stopped. And he said, "Right, we got a young guy who's going to come up and play drums now." He said, and he introduced me, and I thought, "Shit!" Because I kept thinking, "Oh, I can watch someone else, someone another drummer. I've never seen that before." So, and he introduced me, and I, I started shaking and quivering, and he called me up on the drums. I sat behind the drums, and these guys, there's three other guys in front of me, and they were, I sat down, and I looked up. And they looked, they looked like the Giants. Yeah. And I went, really? I went, yeah. <laughs> and said, so, like, one, two, one, two, three. It sounded like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then people went into slow motion suddenly. And I found myself playing. I said, well, I, when I got over the shotgun playing, and I found myself playing. I went, oh, great, this is really good. I really lo loved it. First time I've ever played with anyone. And afterwards, the barman, came up to me and said, Kenny, that was great. He said, really, are you in a band? I said, no, I'm forming one now. My brother's just bought a guitar. He's learning how to play it, a, a Gresh. And I said, oh, great. He said, shall I bring him down next week? So the next, next Friday, he brought him down. And it was Ronnie Lane, walked through the door. Wow. Beautiful. Wow. And he and I hit it off together, and that was it. And then we, he was, Ronnie was playing lead guitar, learning how to play. It was going, so, you know, <laughs> sort of really learning how to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so after after a while, got, we all got, got, kind of got. He got fed up with it being the league. So he said, "I want to play bass. I'm not going to do this anymore." So we went up to the same shop, J Sixes, and walked in there. And on a Saturday morning, the shop was getting busy. And he said, "Can I help this, this guy come up? This little cocky guy come up." So can I help? So yeah, he wants to. He wants to get try our bass out. So he, he said, "Well, come with me. I'll show you. How, I'll show you a couple of bases." And I noticed the drum kit. I was set up on the side there, so I, so I sit behind that, so I started to play it. And this guy was showing Ronnie out uh, these bases. 
And then suddenly we all started playing together. This guy picked up a guitar and Ronnie started playing the bass and I started playing the drums. And of course we were causing havoc in the shop. And the little guy in the shop, little cocky guy in the shop was Steve Marriott. Oh, mate. He Whoa. just brought a tear to my eye. Yeah, so it's, it is a bit like that, yeah. And uh, so we, 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 Ronnie and I already formed a band called The Outcasts. And we were at a gig over at the other side of Tower Bridge. And um, we invited Steve that 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 day, that evening, to come 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 join in with us. That's a brilliant name. It's very advanced. I'm sorry, The Outcast. I mean, that could have been a punk band. Oh, yeah, I know. The Outcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean it's, yes. I, I often wonder what happened to The Outcast. <laughs> and Steve's, <laughs> St- <clears throat> Steve's quite a thea- was a, quite a theatrical kid, wasn't he? Well, yeah, he was, I mean, he should have been called... We should have called ourselves the Artful Dodgers because we he, he turned us all into our Artful Dodgers. I mean, we were little toe rags. We were, and because uh, he was an actor, so, wasn't he, Steve? He, he played. He was the original Oliver and, and Oliver. It's amazing. And so, when did he start singing? Well, what happened was we we asked, asked him to, to we, said, we got to know him and he said, oh, "I'm a I sing and and we said, "Well, we think we've seen you here and there in East End." East End. And he said, "Oh, yeah, we would have done." So he said, "We'll come up and sing with us." So we invited him up to sing with the band, and he got behind the piano, an old upright piano, you know. So we started playing away rock and roll, you know. I mean, we all started joining. And it was it was great, I got to say. And he suddenly get carried. Steve was getting carried away, banging on the banging on the keys, and then he jumped on the piano, started with his feet on the playing with his feet, jumping up and down, broke the piano, and we got thrown out of the pub. Oh my God! <laughs> so we ended, up, we ended up sitting on the on uh, outside the pub, over to our bridge, on a on our uh, on, on Ronnie Lane's amplifier and my 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 drum cases, and we would look at each other and start burst out laughing, and that is the birth of the small faces. <laughs> oh wow! Uh, what were you listening to at this point? What was your kind of music oh, we, bringing you together? Music. We were listening to a lot of Ray Charles, Jimmy McGriff. He used to smoke a little weed then in those days. Already? Oh yeah, I, mean, I was smoking since the age of seven. Weed? No, cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, it's what well, it's what you did as part from the bananas and the steak. You definitely had to smoke in the East End, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, we were talking about this uh, guy and I yesterday about where all these records, these blues records, were suddenly like appearing yeah. in your lives, and uh, and I wondered. You know who who was the guy who was getting those, and who did you suggest, uh, guy? You said it was uh, oh Guy, guy Stevens, Stevens that, that, yeah. that was the man. Yeah, it, it could have been Guy. It was lots of people, but mainly mainly Steve, really, because Steve had a pretty good collection. He was collecting it anyway. He had a great collection of blues songs, and we always still loved the blues and stuff. So did Ronnie Lane. For her. I only had three leg, three records that I learned to play drums to, and that was one of them was Twelve Street Rag and the um, theme from Rawhide that my dad liked. So I learned to play drums to the oh, That's fantastic. Fantastic. But, Sh- but Chicago Blues was really big, wasn't it? Muddy Waters started coming. Oh, yeah. Muddy Waters, yeah. And also, we used to go, was, in those days, there were, there were blues tours in those days. And so that was great. And I, it was, it was, I think I got drum sick. Yeah? Oh, no. Someone, my little granddaughter was nicked him. Um, <laughs> when, oh, I used a pencil. <laughs> so when, when you... When the guy was playing playing drums, like, he's just playing jazz like that, and then you go turn it around, spinning it around. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, I just it's lovely. I, I just love that, just the the, the sort of laid back feel oh, and right. blues. And, you know, it's called the mo- you're playing your emotions. As I've been trying to tell people, forget all these drum machines and forget all these clicks and stuff like that. The reason we like. The reason we like to play the, the way we, we play and where we started, it's called feel. Yeah. So you're feeling your emotion. Your emotion and your feel is transferred to your feel. That's what you're playing. Your your whole body is taken up with the feeling of that song and the way you play. You know the feeling. Yeah, but that's interesting because I've never heard anyone describe feel in that way as being oh, feel. That's a, that's and, a and, and, you know, the... Th- I live my life by that. The thing that. is, yeah. with your drumming, Kenny, is it's always been really super expressive. You know, it, it doesn't just sit still and it, it's it's moving with the song. It respects the song. Yeah. yeah I, it's it's musical. It's it's a musical instrument rather than a time. Well, what I do, I, everyone that. asks me, you know, what do I do? How do I do it? I just, I said, I just play me. You know, if you can say it, you can play it. 
Oh, so, so, so when, when did when did but Jimmy Winston come, come around? Because his parents owned a pub, didn't they? That that you ended up playing. Yeah, well, we were rehearsing there in there one day, and uh, we had to get him to join the band so we could keep rehearsing in the pub. Because yeah, he was playing. Was he was playing guitar when you made that film, didn't you? Dateline Diamonds. Dateline and he Diamonds. Was playing, yeah. yeah, crazy. Yeah. Like, with, yeah, which um, and he's playing guitar in that. Yeah, and there's a nice but, little yeah. connection for you guys, Dateline Diamonds, isn't there? Really. Well, Ke- Kenneth Cope plays your manager. Exactly, yeah. Diamond. I know. You, and, I was so pleased to meet him because he, he was watching on TV and he played William Tell, you see. That's <laughs> right. Well, because no, he then went on to play Marty Hopkirk yeah, and Randall and Hopkirk yeah, Deceased. Right. Well, my dad was Jeff Randall. Oh, really? Oh, well, yeah. Well, 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 <laughs> oh, pleased to meet you, a descendant of <laughs> those days. Yeah, but uh, I think, what, you know, was this the was this suddenly called... Small faces. Were you mods? I mean, you know, we all know and we grow up with the myth and we look at these pictures and you are the icon of mod for us. You know, that that's, that sort of fashion youth oh, yeah. cult. When we were kids, when we, when we first met each other, there was no real fashion then at all. It was the start of the early mods and Ready Steady Go was just, uh, oh, hang on, there's a couple of old, other TV shows are on. But, um, because oh, we all grew up in black and white. I mean, I grew up in black and white. We all did. Just, just after the war. So everyone wore sort of grey and black suits and you know, that sort of thing. And everywhere you went, there was no colour in any shops or whatever. And uh, for instance, I, there was a, sh- uh, a shop uh, that I found in Allgate East. That, and I noticed this red caravel jumper in the window. And I thought, shit, a colour. I can't believe it. So I, 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 I had to save up to buy this, this jumper. And it was uh, bright red, and I eventually, I think it was thirty bob it cost, which was a lot of money in those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After a couple of weeks, I had enough money to go and buy it. I bought it. Then I thought I got some Levi's, and I bleached them, but they all went white. So I, I, I ended up with white Levi's and, and this and this red jumper. Oh. So, that, so, so we were kind of making it up as we went along. And every time we wore something, we go to a gig, and everyone was looking the same as us. Were you very much, because certainly, I mean, the two bands are you and The Who, right? And it's where, of course, Pete was very much trying to talk to his audience and reflect the audience. Were you, in, I mean, apart from the clothes, were you immersed in the mod culture or were you just a pop group or as often? No, no, we, 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 we kind, of, kind of invented it in a sense. I mean, partly because basically when we got to meet Don Arden we, and he became our manager, that was in Carnaby Street. And there was only three shops in Carnaby Street in those days. One was uh, John Stevens, and our manager's oh, office yeah. was above jo- the, sh- the John Stevens. Oh, There's a I sign there that says the small faces lived here. Then there was another one called Top- a shoe shop called Toppers. Oh yeah, yeah. And then Lord, yeah, yeah, Lord yeah. John. Lord John. Lord John. Come so on. We, and we ended up having accounts in all these shops because we never got any money from uh, from Don Arden. So I went. I used to drive my little mini up there and go buy ten shirts every day and flog them to my mates. Oh, okay. So it wasn't that, but because this whole thing of you just getting clothes no. instead of money, you were managing to turn that into. Oh money. yeah, it's kind, of, kind of yeah. So eventually, yeah. the sort of the, the mod thing kept turned commercial, and those the, the rag trade sort of cottoned onto it, and then more shops ended up down in Carnaby Street. Then then Kings Road happened, and you know who do you, you know, think? Who do you think? Who do you credit for starting that haircut? That mod, what we know as the mod haircut, with us. It's it's kind of backcombing, wasn't it? Yeah, the backcombing. Steve used to do that, fun out. But was there a particular kid, a face that you thought, you know, everyone wanted to follow at the time? A couple of guys. A couple of guys. I mean, it really came up, came through the, the East End. There was scooters, like the Italians came over and opened up cafes everywhere on the corner of everywhere. And there was scooters. They brought the scooters over. The Vespers and the... And the the Labrettas. Lab- yeah. and that. So, so, so the whole mods thing started. You know, so everyone... Sort of very young, like so you, you could get a, a, life, a, a motorbike license for, and you're 16 with their place on. Did you have a scooter, Kenny? No, I nicked nick one when I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's the best answer. <laughs> I, I did, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 we have to, I have to try and keep some sort of angle. Uh, you know, move this story along. Don Arden finds you. Don Arden's quite famous, isn't he, as, as, a, as a manager? Yeah, he was, he was kind of... He, 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 that time, he was managing the animals and, and the national teens. But it was very much this old school, wasn't it? Because we now know... It kind of started... I mean, Epstein to an extent, but then Peter Grant basically invented this thing of where 
your band or your little family and they're a thing that you protect and you nurture. Whereas Don Arden was from the school of they're just something to be fleeced and exploited, right? Kind of, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, when we first met him, it, it was like a, like a father figure. He said, I, I'm going to sign you up, boys. He said, but I, I, you can either have a percentage or a wage. Which one do you want? He said, oh, we're going to go outside and have a meeting. So, oh, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly we walked back in and said, we want both. <laughs> <laughs> so we want a percentage and we want a, a, a wage. And he said, I'll give you 20 quid a week each, right? Which is average man's working wage in those days. And he said, I'll give you a percentage. That was like one and a half percent or something, daft like that. He said, okay, we want 60 pounds a week each. <laughs> so we got that. Oh, you got it? Mm. Oh, that's all right. Then after we did a few gigs, yeah. started, money started to come in. We said, we wanted to give give our parents 20 quid each, a week each. So <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so, for doing your washing and everything. Yeah. So all that was going on. And then suddenly he said, look, right, boys, he said, because we said, well, what's happening to the money? He said, well, I'm opened you a bank account. I'll look after your money, boys. I really will. So he said, okay, but Don, so we knew, we thought Don was looking after our money, which he, he did look after it, really looked after it. Himself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was it. And that was Sharon Arden. I used to know Sharon Arden. And she was a little Sharon girl. Sharon Osborne, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, she, yeah, Sharon Osborne, yeah. Because you, you unveiled the plaque to him, didn't you? Yeah, because so, yeah, they, they said to me... It makes it feel like there's still some lingering affection. Uh, yeah, some, kind of. No, it's, it's, just, a, yeah. It's, a, it's a shop window now. That, and that below that that that, that, uh, that plaque, there's, that's where I took the, the doorway was to go into our offices. On Carnaby Street. You know, well, you really touched me a minute ago, Kenny, when you were saying that you wanted some money to give to your parents. Because... Uh, for me, that was, I mean, that was such a working class thing. My my dad, right from my first Saturday job, in fact, from my paper round, made me give a third of whatever I earned to my mum for housekeeping. Yeah, yeah. And all the way... Was your dad Don Arden? <laughs> <laughs> all the way through my, um, you know, work with Spandau. And while I was, you know, I was always, I'd give a third of my money to my mum. To, but while yeah. I was still living at home, while I was still living at home. That was the thing to do, even, even when we were in the outcast about the band we had, Ronnie Lane and I, we used to, we used to go, um, we played a pub every weekend, I would earn like 15 quid, and then during the week, you know, I'd earn another tenner from doing a couple of more gigs like a town hall. So, and I used to earn like 25 quid a week in those days, just, you know, which is more than my dad earned. Mm. So I, I came back, I used to give my mum half the money, so for just, yeah. you know, for just looking after Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. I mean, at what point do you actually leave home? Good question, actually. I, yeah. I, I should go home one day, really. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it all happened really quickly in the small faces. Before I knew it, I mean, I learned to play drums at, at th 13 years old. Uh, but t by the time we got to 15, you know, I was, I was, uh, I'd hit a record in the charts so with what you're going to do about it. Was The Who a kind of uh, a band that you set your sights on as being comparable to you guys? Well, when we had NME and all, uh, all the music papers had us down as rival bands and we hated each other's guts, that's what they said until we met each other. And that was it. We just ended up touring together, become great mates. It was like being in one great big band. Yeah, well, you did that. that you had that horrific Australian tour together. Oh, God. As soon, soon as we landed, we straight so. into, landed in Sydney, straight into a press conference, these guys, press came out and said, right, what drugs are you on? No. <laughs> Pete got really angry and said, "Oh no, any fucking jokes! Nice, nice welcome you're giving us here." And so, so that was that. And they they kind of hated us from the world go. Just to go back a bit, because what's funny is because of course you end up joining the Who, and there's this quite big thing about how different your drumming style is. But because if you listen to a lot of those early Small Faces records, you are actually pretty mad. You're quite Mooney esque early on, weren't you? You are quite an explosive. Well, if you, if you drummer, listen to the early stuff, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a, a, just a natural way of um, us playing. This album that I brought out is that one of those particular gigs I was saying in Belgium. Oh, 1966 oh, yeah, live. Yeah. Uh, small faces. Yeah. That, you listen to that, you see where Zeppelin is coming from. Oh, yeah. We listen, I listen to oh, it. Oh, oh, yeah. This is something we've been talking about this. Because. Well, <clears throat> It's a nice little thing here, because I know that Robert Plant was a massive Small Faces fan yeah. and followed yeah, you around funny. everywhere. And, and there's a track um, called uh, You Need Loving, um, 
which is actually funnily enough uh, Steve on that live album you just show me from 66 Steve Marriott yeah. introduces it as, as you need love um yeah. which was the muddy waters track right so it starts off as a kind of version uh, yeah. but it's different it's different but it's kind of influenced by muddy waters and you need loving the first verse of you need loving is 100 percent lyrically almost musically the first verse of whole lot of love yeah exactly yeah when whole lot of love came out did you lot not go hang on a minute that's our song we, yeah kind of yeah but the thing was it was uh we didn't mind really we didn't listen to Zeppelin as, as much as they, they kind of nicked a few ideas from us so we, it was a, we took it as a compliment yeah wow Wow, and I suppose Muddy All Waters right. really well. Willie Dixon wrote the original. Yeah, didn't he? exactly. Yeah, but do you remember? Do you remember Robert Plant in the audience following you around us? Well, you, you used to, you, yeah, you used to come to the gigs and it, you used to come backstage and you'd go, "Oh no, there's that bloke again. He's seven foot tall." <laughs> <laughs> Compared to you, yeah. It's that. It's that. It's that Brummy. It's that tall Brummy again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it, was, it was great. It just always wanted to pick up a few tips here and there. It was great. Let's talk about um, Ogden's Nut Gone Flake. Yeah, because Ogden's Nut Gone Flake, mate. I, I mean, to go into you know, this is you know one of the first concept albums, or the second side of it at least is is what you'd call a concept album. I suppose. Yeah. I suppose it has a story. Or, uh, well, I was saying to go, it's more like it's kind of like um, a quick one in a way, isn't it? In that you've just got a mini operetta sort of thing. I only know one stuck quick on one. An album. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, just... it's about a kid who's lost the moon or something is looking for the other half of the moon he's looking for the how, other half were you all on acid or something Kenny what happened many different things <laughs> but what happened was how it came about when we were on immediate records uh, Andrew, Andrew Oldham said I've, uh, you've got to go and write some songs guys so I fixed you up a, a, a boat each I fired a boat each for you on the Thames <laughs> So we, of course. So we went, yeah, hey, lovely. So we, so we, got, we ended up with a boat each. It's another story in itself. That is funny. But, Why a boat each? Surely you want to be on a boat together. I don't know. We put our girlfriends with us and stuff. Right. It's like a caravan, you know, on, on a speed, <laughs> on the water. So we ended up having a great weekend, bashing in different boats. and you know, I didn't understand tides and anything like that. So, you know, currents and stuff. The only current I knew was in my mum's cupboard. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, with your bananas, yeah, bananas. So, so trying to turn the boat around and it's up drifting into a, a disused destroyer that this family were living in, uh, converted it into a, a, a home. And I went for sailing into the side of it, into the port. I mean, <coughs> my face hit the port, uh, the, the, the windscreen of the boat it landed over, over my head, and I my, my face was pressed up against the port hole like that. <laughs> And inside was there people eating their Sunday dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my experience of being a sailor. Um, the Mac was, uh, he was, he was sailing. I was behind Mac in, a, in my boat. And then it, I could see this guy, this other boat coming towards Mac in his boat. And this guy was, was yeah, it was a, like a sailboat with the sails down. And he was on the front being so proud, this guy. He was dressed in white, had a white, white shirt. White shoes, white socks, everything was right. And he was like, like this, you know. And he, this, he could see the look on his face was getting more and more concerned as Mac approached. <laughs> so Mac ended up scraping down the whole side of this guy's yacht. Oh, no. <laughs> and he said, oh, I remember uh, this guy was shouting out to Mac, scourge of the sea, scourge of the sea. <laughs> What sort of boats were they then? Well, they were kind of little, they were like, caravan, car, yeah, little motorboats, like, yeah. like a caravan on wheels. And on, somehow, on, out of all of this, Ogden's nut gone flake appeared. I'll, I'll get there in the end. <laughs> we moored up against the side of the Thames and we lit a fire and we thought we'd better write some songs. We haven't done anything. So, nothing would happen. We sat down to write some songs and couldn't think of anything. <laughs> so, someone, one of us, I don't know which one I said, just looked up in the in the moon, and so I went, where's the other half of the moon? I don't know, where's he gone? That's how it came about. Stan was uh, Ronnie Lane's father. Oh. That is his name. Yeah. So, and he was always happy, Ron, Ronnie's dad. He was, and he had, like, you know, he's a, he's a lovely, over, he wasn't overweight, but he had three double chins. So, and when he laughed, he was, oh, just all shook. <laughs> he, he was always happy and laughing. Oh. So, 
That's where happiness oh. Stan came from. Because Stanley Unwin wasn't your first choice. Was Hang he? on, just can we just explain who Stanley Unwin is? Well, yeah. Stanley Unwin, he's uh, he talks gobbledygook and he goes, "Are uh, uh, you're sitting up the bowl too square on your body?" Then I'll begin. Yeah. Uh, Flodio, deep, yeah. deep, deep joy. He's in a couple of movies, carry on movies and stuff like that. Deep joy. It, he basically he basically invented his own take on the English yeah. language. Yeah. yeah. Violin is scratchy on the cat guy. Yeah, you know, three, three, four years I'll go down the hot floor, down the garden, bath floaters, and all of a sudden a big floor, floor will come around the corner. Yeah, and, it, and he, used, he used to be on TV all the time when we were kids. Yeah. So you got him yeah. to sort of do some little narration between each track, didn't you, on that second yeah, side? Yeah, well, so we wanted Eric Sites to do it. And Eric Sites <sighs> wanted to do it, but he couldn't do it, it's busy. So we, we ended up getting uh, uh, Stanley Elman in. So did you did did you write the lines for him and then he just turned it into his? Well, language. he said when he came to the studio, he said, "Look, I just want to get to know each one of you." So we spent some time with each one of us, so he could pick up on, on our mannerisms and yeah. stuff like that. So you know, blow your because we, oh. we we used to say, "Cool man," he's oh, this guy's blown his cool, that, that sort of thing. And so, so you go, "Blow your cool man," and do this deep focus. Wow. <laughs> But but this is an extraordinary wow. record, and even today people hold it up as being one of the you know one of the most important yeah. albums in in the history of music. Well, I, I love it. I love my drumming on it. I think it's great. I mean that opening instrumental, which is really the sort of overture, is is a phenomenal yeah. piece of work, and would have influenced Pete and Tommy surely. Well, I actually, it was actually my tune. I, I just because I don't play guitar, I had to I had to, I had to hum it to everyone. <laughs> no, uh, all right because. You didn't have your banjo. I didn't have a banjo, but nowhere near it. <laughs> wow. So what happened was, I mean, I, in those days, I was doing se- lots of sessions for other people. A lot of people wanted me to play on their records, so I just ended up doing these big band sessions. So and I was playing, and I was playing. I found myself playing on these great big fields, the orchestral fields, and you and I really, really got into it. And I just loved these big, you know. And so when it came to doing old tunes, I, I kind of took those. That flavour of what I learned in, from the studio and big planning, big bands, uh, and sort of put my drumming style into that. Yeah. Well, what's what's interesting here? You say that Kenny is the fact that cause that's quite unusual. I mean, it's a great testament to you. The fact that you because people back then you were either a band guy or a session guy. Mm-hmm. The fact that I, for a start, where did you find the time? Well, I, I used to love playing with different people. And it was also very nerve wracking at the time as well because I couldn't read music. My girlfriend's at that time. Her father was uh, Tony Osborne, the band leader. Oh, okay. And he introduced me to my very first session. He said, "He said, I said, but I don't read. I don't. Read, I don't read music." He said, oh, "Yeah, you can do a session for me. I'll teach you how to read music." He said, oh, "You can't teach me in five seconds flat." He said, "Yes, I <laughs> come out." And he split up with his wife by then. So he said, "Come out to my flat." So I went around to his flat. I said, "Look, this. This. Show me the piece of paper you write music." He said, "Look, that's a bar. One, two, three, four. There's a bar, yeah. And that line, top line is your, your symbol and that one's down at your foot and your bass line. I said, I'm not going to pick all this up in time. Uh, he said, no, yeah, just concentrate. Played the song that I was going to play on the next day. And it was in Trident Studios. It just, just built Trident Studios in Mordor Street. So, in Soho? I ended up below the control room. The control room was upstairs. Below the control room was, was the rhythm section. In the rhythm section was Herbie Flowers on bass and, oh, wow. and Big Jim Sullivan on guitar. Wow! And, and little me sitting in between them, oh, so wow. they just sort of we all got. I, they were great guys. I tell you, Herbie was. Yeah, we should point out Big Jim Sullivan was one of the absolute great named session players. Oh yeah, and, 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 and Herbie Flowers yeah. as well. Yeah, we, yeah, well, yeah, but, but Bowie. I've, I've, it's only for our audience because I think people know Herbie Flowers because of Bowie yeah, and Lou Reed. That's right. So but... they made me feel really comfortable. Then the brass section was there, the string section was over there, and there all kinds of stuff in the harps so, and the, my. Father-in-law at the time, standing on the bandstand, right, boom, 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 with his, with his stick, you know, so we're going to play. So now, he looked at me, it just gave me a wink and said, right, okay, we got to play. So we're playing away, getting to play the song, and we're playing it, and just get to this part where we go, ba, 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 boom. I was playing away, and suddenly I went, ba, 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 and the whole orchestra did the same thing with me. I went, ba, ba, and I stopped playing. I went, fuck. And Tony Osborne, my father-in-law, said, what did you stop playing for? I said, I can't believe everyone did it at the same time as me, but I put this little bit of paper. <laughs> From this little bit of paper. <laughs> <laughs> what was the song for? What was the recording for? Uh, 
I don't know, something like Earth Kit, something like but, that. But Pete, Pete oh, asked really? you to play on the Tommy soundtrack, didn't he? Instead of yeah. Keith. That must have been a weird one. Yeah, you know, Keith was, uh, um, he was uh, kind of that known point. for being out of it now and again. So, and Ronnie's on Tommy as well, isn't he? Ronnie, Ronnie's on bit, bit, Ronnie yeah. Wood, yeah. Yeah. So I ended up playing on Tommy in the soundtrack. We've skipped oh, the faces. No, I was yeah, still, no, I was no, still too far. I was, still, I was still in the faces when they, when they asked me to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But after, yeah. after with Nut, Ogden's Nut Gone Flake that comes out, incredible cover as well. It's a round cover. I mean, everything about this is unique. In fact, where did the where did the title come from? Once we finished the album, we were looking. We had a little flat called in in uh, Pimlico. Everyone used to come around and smoke weed and go. Uh, yeah, ended up looking down at this tin after figuring out what what kind of talking about what what album cover we could do. So we all looked down and looked at this tin, and the lid was on the side, and the the, the tobacco was it's called Ogden's Tobacco Pipe Smoking Bagger. It was great for for rolling your joints. And the, and the packet of Rizzlers, right, which we ended up calling, turn, turn it into sus, like, instead of calling it Rizzlers, we call it sus, like, sus, S-U-S, -S -S, suspect. So it was a nod to sort of taking drugs, really, the Ogden's nut. Come on, come on, what's up? Well, it was, so... Well, you used that a lot, didn't you? You had some pretty well, well, here come the nice. in your songs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We took the tin. I thought, that's a, that's a great... We like the, the cover of the tin. So we said, OK, we'll call it Ogden's Nut gone, flake. So when you smoke your joints, it makes your nut go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. I never knew that. That's fantastic. So, <laughs> so that's how the album cover came about. The bit in the middle, when you open the cover, there's a medieval sort of uh, drawing, and that was a friend of Mac who did that. But you, um, you could, you never got to play it live, did you? That, well, not really. Or was it once? You did it once, didn't you? No, that was that would be all mine to the bloody thing. Ah. Oh. And, and that's what was driving Steve Mapp, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, all of us. I mean, by this, by this oh, time, we'd had lots of uh, commercial records out and it was driving us nuts because we, we could not lose this teeny bopper image. And if you listen to that's why I like this album so much, because of the discovery of it, because basically... That's what, I often wonder what, 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 what kind of music we're going to turn into. The live album, yeah. Yeah. Yes, the live album is going, which we could say, which we've both been listening to, by the way, and the energy on that it's, is just it's great. phenomenal. It's, it's, yeah. it's very, very much free form. There's one title song called Oop Oop We Do. I don't remember. I think it's a stupid title, Oop Oop We Do. But, but it was all getting quite adventurous because one, one of your last singles, The Universal, Steve recorded it in his garden on a cassette and you could hear the dog barking and everything, can't you? I don't know. That, Someone just sent me that this morning when I was opening my mail, looking for, looking now to get to, uh, to get onto the into the onto the net with you guys. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> but but Universal. but what happened then with, with Steve leaving? What what? How did you feel at that point when it was? It felt like things were collapsing around you. Well, it was uh, it was uh, it was a hard breakup basically because when it happened. We, 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 none of us were really surprised, but we were surprised in the way that Steve did it. We were at Alexandra Palace, and I think it was New Year's Eve, something like that. And uh, Steve just he just threw his guitar down and walked off stage and left us there. Wow. That's what, didn't he say, I quit, or something, as but, he left? Yeah. But it's, this seems like, but you have very much, this is be the problem with a lot of, it's a very English thing, this, because I remember Nick said the same thing in interviews with Pink Floyd, is that, most problems just like this come from people just not talking to each exactly. other. Exactly. If you just had a chat about... Well, you know, I'm kind of... When I joined New York, I've always been jealous of, when I, of, of bands that have stayed together, like the Stones and some of the Beatles and, and you know, uh, the Who. It's genesis, really. You can overcome any problem if you talk to each other. And there's enough, there's enough room in music for everyone to go off and do their solo stuff and still come back to the band. Yeah. yeah, but in my opinion, though, Kelly, I mean, I, I, what happened then was great for me because I ended up with yes. two of the most fantastic well, yeah. bands because I was a bit young for Small Faces. So my, my, me getting into Small Faces was, was in retrospect. But, yeah. but, but now, you know, my record collection, the two greatest records that I had in my collection as a kid, you know, one was Nods As Good As A Wink and the other one was, was, was Humble Pie Rock In The Fillmore. So... Yeah. Out, out of that split came two fantastic bands, but but yeah. but you, I mean, we've got to talk about your introduction to Rod Stewart and and Ronnie Wood and how that happened. When we split up, 
we were quite friendly with the Stones anyway, because of immediate records. We, they were in and out. Of the, Andrew uh, Lou Goldham, yeah. Andrew, they said, well, "What are you going to do now?" So we said, "Well, we're just going to we just get together once a week and just try and play." We they said, "Well, we've got a, a place where we keep a warehouse where we keep all our equipment in in Bermondsey, in the East End." So I said, "Okay, great." He said, "Well, you, you can use it. We've got a soundproof room down there, so go. You can use it as much as you like." So we went down every every week. Used to get together and just just go and have a jam. This went on for a couple of weeks. Until one day, Ronnie Lane brought down his new next door neighbour, and that was Ronnie Wood when he came in. Who was in the Jeff Beck group, right? Wow. Playing bass. He was yeah. in the Jeff playing bass. Playing bass. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, Woody is a fantastic bass player. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was learning to play, not or not learning to play. He was just converting to, to to guitar. So so he was playing guitar and stuff like that. So and that, you know, and then suddenly, a couple of weeks later, Ronnie Wood brought down his his one of his best mates, and that was. Rod Stewart. So Rod used to sit on the amps waiting for us to go up the pub. And had you never come across Rod before, so on the scene in his old uh, Yeah, because I'd, I'd, I'd occasionally pass him on the stairs going in, in and out of um, immediate records. So I knew he had he was a North like London that, boy, but... wasn't he? He was a bit long. So he was also singing in the Jeff Beck band yeah, as well. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. But... And incredibly shy. Incredibly shy back yeah. then, wasn't he? Like hiding behind the amps, or literally even but, being but, on stage. But so, still, <laughs> seriously, yeah. one of the, the most amazing dresser, wasn't he? I mean, incredible face. No, he's always a good dresser. They called him Rod Demod. That's right. Yeah. Do you, but do you remember that first song you played together with Rod, with with Ronnie on guitar and Rod singing? Not really. I think it's more like just a, a jam of bluesy sort of stuff. Right, right, right. Because what I remember is, I was sitting there with my. Critical hour. You know, being a drummer, you've got the best seat in the house, you know. I'm sitting there playing. And I watch everything going on. And suddenly I thought, I said, I said, look, we've got to take this serious. I said, you know, it's, look, um, there's, I said, you've got to start singing. You know, someone's got to start singing. I know Ronnie had a great voice. Ronnie Lane. Yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie sang. And it's, it's always a beautiful sound in his voice. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Very emotional. Yeah. And then Max started singing. And I went, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Ronnie, Lowe, Ronnie Wood started to sing, and yeah. And all the time I'm looking at Rod sitting on the ants. Then we had a break and went up the pub. The, it was called the Bermondsey, Bermondsey Arms in Bermondsey Street. And we was going to the pub in there. So when we walked in there, I said, I said Rod, I did an Adam Faith and I got him around the shoulder. I said, can I have a way in another bar? I said, yeah, okay, great. So we're in another bar. Oh, fancy a drink. Yeah, fancy, yeah. fancy a drink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, and I said, I said, do you fancy joining the band? And he went, I said, do you think everyone would let me? I said, I said, yeah, of course not. And that evening, Alvin Lee was having a uh, a little smoking, drinking party around in his muse flat, back of Arlen Street. So we went back there to his place and sort of had a, a drink or whatever. And I said to the rest of the band, can I have a word with everyone upstairs? So I went upstairs with everyone. I said, look, I've asked Ron to join the band. And all of a sudden I got back. Oh, we don't want another prima donna. We don't want another... Uh, Steve Merritt walking out on us and stuff like that. Oh, fucking hell. This went on forever. So I just I just stood my ground and went, fuck it. I knew it was a difference. Personally, I knew it was a difference between success and failure from, me, from my point of view. And also, I was waiting. When you that powerful voice of working with Steve all the time, you're going to miss yeah, it. Yeah. We were That's a new band, yeah. so we were a new band, so we could go anywhere we like, you know. So... So that's how we started. Yeah, but so, they uh, were they were sort of right and wrong, weren't they, Kenny? Because obviously they were wrong because the because Faces became one of the greatest rock bands of all time, and still to this day I hold them as one of the, my you know yeah. top five favorite all time records, and is is not yeah. as good as a wink. Um, <clears throat> but also Rod had this other job; he was making a solo record, and you were playing on his solo oh. records and he was always thinking am I going to go solo am I not going to go solo so and there was a sense that eventually he did have to walk he did walk out I I, I put it down to Brett Eklund really <laughs> right okay but you <laughs> but it was an it was an amazing time wasn't it because you're making records for for the faces and you're also making Rod's solo records weren't you it's a plan both of them in a sense yeah I remember, I remember one yeah. time uh, in the faces so I uh, yeah. called up and said, Kenny, so you know that song we do in, 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 in when we play live, Losing You? I said, yeah. So I'm, I'm recording it now. Can you come and play on it? I said, yeah, no problem. I, was, I remember I was watching a film at the time. 
I got in my car straight away, was in Wilson and I had two seconds flat with it. And then I was sitting behind Mickey Wallace drum kit, playing away. And I did losing you. We called it. Wow. I went, when I went, I said, see you later. But I went back, back to, and I, when I got home, I watched the other half of the film. <laughs> what was the film? I can't wait for I remember. <laughs> no, it wasn't called that. But it's a good time. But did you, did you, yeah. did you play on all the sort of, uh, every picture tells a story or was, was that? A couple of tracks on each each one, yeah. Right. I, 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 so, was there a frustration that maybe this was you were kind of being seen as Rod's backing group at one point? No, at that time, no, because basically what what happened was when when we we ended up getting a deal with uh, Warner Brothers as as a uh, as a, as a new band. So, and I, I remember my accountant said said to me once when the small faces split, he said he said he said what are you going to do now? I said well we've got to get a new record deal. He said. Uh, we'll get an advance and we'll just carry on. They went, how much do you think you're going to get? I said, I don't know why, but £30,000 came into my mind. I said, £30,000? And he went, telephone numbers. So this, this account <laughs> right the fucking... So when we ended up doing it, I'm sorry, it's a long way around to say it. We, we got, ended up getting a deal with Warner Brothers and Billy Gaff, who became our manager, said, how much do you think I should ask for? I said, Thirty thousand pounds, and not a penny more, not a penny less. <laughs> so ended up, I could ended up getting thirty thousand quid, which is a lot of money in those days. Nineteen sixty nine. Yeah, yeah. So, and so we, we, we then it came to signing on the dotted line, you know, and the boss of the record company that was a guy called Ian Ralphini. He just got the sign on sign sign on the dotted line, and I went, hold on a minute, it says small faces here. So we're not. We've, so I don't know what we're going to call our, our band. You know, I said because it's a new band. Nothing like the Small Faces. And he said. He said, "Well, it's, you're you're a known band, so we've been signing you as the Small Faces." He said, in other words, he said, "If you don't call yourself the Small Faces, you can't have any of this money." Right. right. <laughs> so all of a sudden, went, "Fuck it. We want the money. We're all broke. We, we agreed to that day. We said, "We'll we'll call ourselves call the album the first album." Small faces, but thereafter we're going to call it. There's nothing small about us at all. So we're going to chop the small up, and it's going to be, we're going to be faces. That's how the faces name go. Which is actually, in a funny sort of way, couldn't have been a better name for us. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I don't think about small faces when I think about faces. Two different bands. No, because you, I knew the the faces just had that brilliant thing of of, even though the small faces were such a fantastic entity, but the faces. Felt like this ultimate gang who'd been together forever. One hundred percent. I mean, they were a massive yeah. influence on the way we wanted to perform live in the eighties. For in my band, you know, it was you know this this sort of fall about camaraderie, <laughs> having a massive laugh, dangerous yeah. if you like, but never taking the music so seriously that it was merely about having fun, wasn't it? Was it chaotic? Did it feel like that? Yeah, yeah. We used to throw it's, bottles it's, of wine to the audience. When the film is getting together, it's still chaotic. <laughs> 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 so we haven't lost our magic, you know. But um, the thing is, uh, it was like a gig was it wasn't like doing a gig. It was going to going to a gig, which is pleasurable, which is not. It was not a chore. It was like we all had a drink before we went on stage, so we all are fucking cut anyway. <laughs> and the audience had booze. It was in those days the audience would bring booze and do the look. We used to hand it, give them bottles of wine. They, you used to kick footballs out, didn't you? you the audience might have been on stage and we might have been in the audience. It's just one of those great big communal parties. I mean, you get a feeling that Brit Pop yeah. and all that Oasis stuff, none of that would have existed if it wasn't for the faces. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's crazy. Oh, it? but do you remember Stay With Me coming in as a song? Because, you know, that was such an important song for me as a kid. Yeah, yeah. we did it at Olympic Studios. Glyn Johnson was the engineer. Glenn goes all the way back with you, though, doesn't he? For me, he does, yeah. He was, I, even yeah. in the sessions I used to do, Glenn was always probably one of the engineers that was mostly there, very well sought after. And he was a great engineer, just superb. Uh, I, mean, I saw, I saw yeah. Glenn about... Uh, I've, I've seen quite a lot of it, I saw him, but one of the things I had to ask him about three years ago, I said, Glenn, I said, so I finished doing my book, you know. I said, everyone keeps asking me how I got my drum sound. Did you mind me two overhead mics? I remember that. He said, no, just one overhead mic. And he said, I just close mic the snare. That's it. I said, well, how did you get my sound there? He said, it's you, you silly. So I just captured the, <laughs> I just captured the, 
the room sound of the Olympics is that big I see. Yeah, it is a live sound. It is a really live drum sound. I think yeah. that's what adds to the the raucous sort of fun of it all and yeah, the sense it's, of it's the ambient sound. I, I, I'm a great believer in capturing the, the drums, you know, the ambient sound that the drums make in a room. I totally agree. I think people people have got way too precious about yeah, the whole yeah. drum micing yeah, thing. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and you, you, uh, and you ended up sort of getting a drum sound, and you got uh, what used to drive me nuts with certain engineers. I ended up with a, I had a great sort of snare sound, like, <laughs> like, a, like a snare should sound. Then you, I'll get your drum sound, go with drum sound, I ended up sounding like this. Yeah, fuck, it's, it's terrible. Like sounding like a cardboard box. Kenny, was there a sense that uh, it, it was like deja vu, that it was all happening again with when, when Rod and sort of, and the Ronnie's start, starts to slip away. Ronnie, and then Ronnie Lane gets pissed off and leaves. And Oh, Ron, Rod said, you know, said a couple of times to me, he said, well, you know, said, funny enough, so when Ronnie Lane left the band and we continued with Tetsu, something happened to the faces, the spirit of the band went when Ronnie Lane left. And he's right. Kenny, I, I need to get to you you know, joining the who really. And I'm, I'm pushing it that way. Sorry. I apologize. Yeah. But I, and I'm, I'm going to go back and ask that same question. Was there a, a sense of disappointment for you when, when Rod went, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just not going to do any more with the faces. No, what well, it was, it was um, kind of with, on the last tour, Ronnie Wood called us and said, look, he said, uh, um, Mick Taylor's left, uh, left the stones and Mick, Jack has asked me to stand in rather I say find a guitarist for someone. So he said, Ronnie, no, you go and do it with this tour. I said, but keep yourself together because our tour starts in Miami exactly when you finish. So to make sure you, you're ready for that. So I went over to Miami and we rehearsed over there. And when he came back, he came back more Rolling Stone than a face. Right. No. So Rod and I looked at each other and went, yeah, writing's on the wall here. So, so we knew straight away. So Rod and I started a band together. Uh, and so we put a band together and it had Billy Peake on guitar, Il Chen on bass, and Gary, oh God, I can't remember his name now. Granger? Granger. Yes. And he was a great guitar. Well done, guy. So, yeah, but, yeah, great. I love your memory. I don't like mine. <laughs> but so we ended up putting a band together and it sounded fantastic because Billy, Billy Peake, Big on guitar, it was great. And with Gary Granger, so the, the, the unit clicked. And Rod just, you know, was singing away there. And it was, and, he, and I remember Rod saying to me, you know, I've never heard you play like that. So I said, well, I do lots of sessions in between. Like, it's a different band. We had to go to LA to rehearse and as, as a new band. Not not Rod Stewart and something, it was, a, it was a new band. I was an equal member of that band, you know. And in the end, I got cold feet. I remember the, the truck coming around, picking up my flight cases for, to, to, to take to Heathrow Airport. In the end, I thought, I don't like the idea of this. I was staying away for three months and I'm not sure in my heart I want to do this. So I called up Billy Gaffer, our manager at the time. I said, look, Billy, I said, I've got cold feet. I don't really want to do it. I said, I, I do want to do it, but I, don't, I feel disloyal to, to the fans that we've already got. He said, okay, so, so I, ended up, I put the phone down and uh, I spoke to Rod and said, yeah, he said, don't, don't worry, Kenny, it's fine, come on. Uh, I ended up going to get my drum flight cases back in, 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 from Heathrow that, that evening, pulled them out, and then I kept doing sessions after that, just, just playing away. And then I was forming a band with Glenn Johns for Atlantic Records, and it was half American and half English. We were playing away, and uh, I find myself going to one of the trips with the band. I went to America to, uh, to, to meet everyone and do that, whatever. I don't know, I had to fly back to England because I lived in Texas. And so it's kind of half English, half American, half Eagle, half, half East End. If you right, see. right, right. Paul McCartney was producing this film called Buddy Holly Film. So I was invited to that. As soon as I got off a plane, I found myself in a car, straight from the airport, straight to to this this premiere but it's kind of weird it was a, they had a, the premiere was a, you know the after party of the premiere paul had the, the party before right 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 at peppermint, peppermint park. park yeah yeah and so we ended up going to peppermint park and i found myself on the table there with paul and linda keith and his girlfriend keith moon keith moon yeah mm. and his girlfriend and um annette yeah annette and 
David Frost before he was a singer. Paul's brother from the scaffold. Mike. Oh, yeah. Mike. Keith, Keith said to me, how you been, what are you doing? I said, I told him about the band I was doing. He said, yeah, great. He said, fantastic. I said, I said, how are you doing? He said, oh, I said, great. I said, I'm not, I, have not, I didn't, don't take any drugs. And I'm not, I'm not, and they used to drink like a fish. And I said, oh, no, I don't drink anymore. He said, I think, I, doctors give me these pills. If I dare have a drink when I take these pills, he said, I'll get violently ill and sick. So I said, oh, OK. That was the conversation, basically. Then we all walked around to the um, Leicester Square Odeon for the premiere of the film, watched the film. And after after the film, I got, came outside and said goodbye to each other. See you later. Bye. 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 I went home to where I lived in Hampstead then. Went home and uh, went to sleep, came up, woke up the next day. You know when you wake up and turn the TV on, the news came on and it said, oh, it said, uh, Keith Moon was, was found dead in his flat today of a drug overdose. I thought, it can't be true. It just can't be. I just left him. He scored it. He said, I see he's done another practical joke. That, that was that. And it ended up being true, of course. But it was the drugs that were meant to save him, wasn't it? That was the thing. Was... I found out once I joined her, which is another story in itself, I found out that he died of a, a, dr- a drug overdose, but it was accidental. He'd gone back to, to the flat, taken his nighttime pill, and he woke, woke up a couple of hours later thinking it was morning and took, took, took another pill. Oh. Apparently, if you take those pills close together, it slows your heart down. So they're not dying because of that kind of overdose. Yeah, well, they found a load in his stomach. But apparently, this, it's kind of like Michael Jackson. It's the sort of drug that needs to be administered. It's not something you just give a bottle to, especially someone like Keith. You know. How proud were you when you took over from Keith in The Who? Well, it's kind of strange because I never really took over him. Because when I joined, what happened was I, I got a call from Bill. I said, so Kenny, so I'll come straight to the Who's yeah, manager. Sorry. Yeah. So I'll come straight to the point. The Who have had a meeting and they want to, and they want you to join the band and not thinking about anyone else. So I said, well, that's very kind, Bill. I said, very flattering. I said, but it's, uh, I said, I can't, sorry. He went, what do you mean? I, he can't. So I could hear his chin drop on the floor. So he said, look, Pete's coming into the office a bit later on. Do you want to come and have a chat? I said, yeah, I'd always happy to see Pete. So that evening I went to Warner Street and just said hello to Pete. We ended up having a chat, me, Bill, and, and Pete, just talking about the old times of touring. Stuff like that. And then uh, he said to me, you've got to join the band. You, you're one of us. You're a mod. You come through the ranks with us. You're a mod. You're, you're a, a mod. mod. I love that. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's quite funny. But, and so I said, look, I've got, my band by chance is in, in town, at the American site in town today. So I'm going to see him after this. So I said, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll chat through with my band, see what they say. I went back to my band and I said, look, uh, something said, but I said, who have had a meeting? Uh, who have asked me to join them? As a, join them in the band? And they said, well, Kenny, you've got to do it. And they said, graciously, I, I said, well, thank you very much for your understanding. And they said, no, you've got to do it. So that was it. I ended up joining the Who. But I did say in that meeting, if I join, I'm not replacing Keith Moon. I'm not, I'm not copying Keith at all. I'm a completely different drummer. There's only one drummer for the Who. There always will be only one drummer for the Who, and that's Keith Moon. Yeah. Oh. But you did two oh, great oh. albums with The Who. You did Face Dances and It's Hard, you know, with some yeah. fantastic oh, tracks. And you did, I remem- yeah, I'm, I remember seeing you at Wembley, at Wembley Stadium, when you did that. Yeah, I remember seeing you. First, first <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, and also, I flew in... Oh, gee, I don't know if you remember, Kenny, but we shared a helicopter, I think, with, with um, I saw- uh, going to Live Aid in 85. Yeah, because uh, that's funny, because I, I flew myself, I learned to fly a helicopter a couple of years before. So I flew myself, flew myself into in Battersea Air Heli- and parked the helicopter up. And of course, the, the, the pilots saw me land. I said, uh, uh, "Do you want to come and co-pilot the, the, the Live Aid one or two? So two big helicopters, massive ones." And I said, well, "Okay, yeah, no problem." So get in there, sit in there, and yeah, you, you're in the, in the helicopter as well. Yeah, yeah, Spandau Valley were in the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. And I, what I did was I. Got my flew back up, got back into the helicopter, co-piloted that back to to uh, Battersea. Got in my helicopter, and flew back. Was it, it on TV. Was it Noel Edmonds <laughs> in that, uh, that helicopter? It was one of those helicopters. Was it? It, it was his helicopter that I was I was converting to at the time. That was. Way flies as well. Was, yeah, it? that was called a squirrel. No, but I remember I remember talking with Pete backstage at Live Aid, and you know, so excited that the Who were going to play. Because you hadn't played for quite a while. 
And uh, and I walked up onto the side of the stage with Pete, stood right next to John Entwistle's amp, which took my head off. Which blew up. Which blew up, didn't it? Yeah, blew you had, up, you had a few it? technical problems, didn't yeah. you, on on on, on the yeah, no, I'm stuck on oh, fucking death from it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. One of the funniest things I've seen on when I was doing one of the gigs that you know we did was it was um, Roger used to keep ice cream and honey on the side there so he could have a swimful of honey or a swimful of ice cream. Throat. Yeah, to his throat, yeah. And so Roger was always saying, turn it down, John, turn it down, turn it, because it's so loud. Emerson just walked back slowly, just winked at me, walked back slowly, walked back, got all of his ice cream, mixed the two things together, stirred it all up, just, just to piss Roger off. Oh, my God. But uh, yeah, no, great, great. It's when you're sitting... You know, when you you can see everything that's going on when you when you're a drummer, you see everything going on. Uh, we can't keep you much longer. I know you've got to get off, uh, Ken. No. It's been a pleasure, I can say, mate. Ah, oh, it's been it's been actually very very emotional talking to you. Uh, to be honest, it's been one of the yeah. best rock on tours we've yeah. done. I mean, your stories are fantastic, yeah. and and I feel like we've we've only just sort of touched the surface of a lot of. I mean, we could have done a whole show about the small faces. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much more we could do because, because Kenny, you've been involved in so much music that is really the closest music to our hearts. I'm glad you like what we've done so far. <laughs> there's yeah. more to come. <laughs> Keep it up, mate. Keep it up. Oh, I can't yeah. wait to hear the the new faces uh, stuff you're doing. I mean, is the plan to get an album out at some stage? Yeah, the, the idea is we, we've got uh, it's a it's a mixture of what we, Ronnie's found and I found in my collection and his collection, and so we we've got we found a couple of songs that have not been released. So and so we're going to put those on and rework those. Hang on a minute. Have you actually is some of it old uh, demos w with with Mac on it? Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my so god. We got some new new old stuff, you see, man, which is too too good to to pass up on. So we're, we're, we're playing with that at the moment. Brilliant. Yeah, so one of, we've done a, a track called "I Can Feel the Fire," which is Ronnie's Ronnie Woods solo album. Oh. But this, we've wow. done it slightly different, so. So lots of different little things. I don't want to say too much because you know these things change. And it, I've, I just mentioned one song. No, 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 it'll be on there, but maybe, maybe it won't be on there. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we'll look forward to it anyway because absolutely, yeah. Kenny. You're... Well, now you got, now you got to send me some of your summer. You know, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> that you and Nick and all that. Yeah. Listen, let's stay in touch and. Um... Oh, thank yeah. you so much for doing this. It's been a total joy. What would what would Stanley Unwin have said? Deep, Deep joy. joy. Oh, you made my day. That's right. You made my morning. I'm going to oh. go and have a cup of tea now. Cheers, mate. Oh, oh, guy, that was unbelievable. Oh, that was quite overwhelming. He's a great really. storyteller, isn't he? He's a great storyteller. I could sit with him all day. You know, that's 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 a man who. Was I can already see our Twitter responses saying part two, please, part two. I, I felt like yeah, yeah. Part, part part three. I felt like we were sort of skimming a lot of stuff with the Who and yeah, we re it was terrible that we missed loads of really really big. But to be fair, I think the stuff we were getting was not the standard interview fare, which is of course is our raison yeah. d'etre. So it's you know you can there's all that other stuff you can get other places, but this yeah, is the yeah, you know yeah I don't know. What, so we're something. we're off to Europe for nine weeks, aren't we? Nearly nine weeks, starting Friday. Nearly nine weeks, and it's a really grueling schedule. We're going to try, try and still keep these up as yeah, much as yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So keep your eye on the website, on the uh, podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. And um, well, I've got a good socials. feeling about this. I think we can. We're taking our little devices on the road with us, and I think we'll be able to make it work. Um, well, I can't wait to listen to this one back. No, I really can't. All right, it's All good right. night from me, and it's good night from them.